Well, good morning. It's a joy to be with you. Good to see all of you. I wish you could see how beautiful this picture is. God's people gathered under his name. Some of you have lived uh, all over the world and some of you in third world countries and those of us who have are particularly thankful for a lot of elements of Western civilization that we enjoy day by day. But Western civilization increasingly operates under a worldview otherwise known as materialism. And by that, I don't just mean that we love stuff. It means that reality exists entirely in the physical elements that make it up. In other words, just as God has given us uh, senses that enable us to enjoy uh, beautiful weather and beautiful things and hear beautiful music and, and enjoy uh, touching and, and all of the things that our senses allow us to do, that is not the sum total of reality. In fact, it's, it's, it's like walking around with blinders on and trying to see light behind those blinders to have a worldview of that nature. And so there is a mysterious spiritual reality that not only exists beyond the physical, but the spiritual reality is actually the driving force behind the physical, not the other way around. There is a spiritual reality that drives the physical reality, not the other way around. This is the realm of mystery. And so revelation, the word revelation, by definition, is a partial peeling back of the curtain of mystery. And it is God revealing himself as the creator and sustainer of all reality. God, as you know, has chosen to ordain scripture as the tangible means through which he reveals himself to us and reveals a grid through which we can see the world properly with both the spiritual elements and the physical under his authority. And so the last book of the Bible is aptly named Revelation because through this gracious disclosure, not only of God, but of the hidden realities behind all the physical, John has painted for us in words the prophetic vision that God first imparted to him in A.D. 96. Thus far in our study of this book, we have uh, our spiritual understanding, at least mine, has been enlightened and stretched. But we've also had a refresher course in how to learn to be content with mystery, to say that, God, you are infinite in knowledge and I am finite and I have to trust you with the things that I don't understand. Proverbs, in fact, commands that, says, lean not on your own understanding in all your ways and and trust the Lord instead because the secret things belong to God and he has revealed things to us and our children that belong to us. And so today, as we enter chapter 13 of Revelation, if you have your Bible, please turn there. John begins to describe what lies behind the mystery of lawlessness. Paul has already taught on that subject in his second letter to the Thessalonians where he says that even then, when Paul penned the letter, that the mystery of lawlessness was already at work because lawlessness seems to increasingly characterize almost every society around the world today. We can eagerly attest to lawlessness already being at work, it often makes us wonder, at least it makes me wonder, if, if we're not on the, on the verge of this great final crisis, this great final conflict, spiritual conflict that will immediately precede the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whether we are or not, I don't know. But I do know this, that God wants to teach us how to remain faithful in a world awash with the turmoil of sin on every side. And so the title of the message this morning is Surviving the Mystery of Lawlessness. The most, if you're a, a new Christian or just have a hunger for the world, the, the word, the most boots on the ground tutorial, if you will, of how to follow Jesus in a sin-cursed world is First John. And in 1 John, he wrote to the churches of Asia Minor and and said this, 1 John 3, 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. That's pretty easy to understand, right? Even as we're teaching our children in the classes, 
uh, over there. Basically, God gave us 10 commandments that encompass all of the rest, and breaking those commandments is, is a tossing aside of the law. It's a lawless view of life so that I can do whatever I want to do in my own eyes instead of being under God's authority. And so we know from Genesis 3 that it was the serpent, Satan himself, that first tempted Eve to sin. Remember how he did that? He first questioned the authority of God. Did God really say? Then he, he questioned the decree of God. You will not surely die. He, he was a deceiver. And Adam and Eve bit the apple, which was figurative of the, the, the command that God had commanded them not to eat of. And they began the practice in our human race of a lifestyle of lawlessness. That really characterizes everybody that's not in union with Jesus Christ because they live under their own law. And even though in the middle of human history, God sent his son who was born in innocence to live the only obedient life, the only lawful life that's ever been lived under God Almighty. He walked in perfect obedience to his father. And then in fuller obedience to the Father, was offered up as the Lamb of God to die the death that we deserve because the, the wages of sin is death. So what we lawless people deserve is to die under the wrath of God, and that's exactly what Jesus did as the sacrificial lamb fulfilling all the sacrifices of the Old Testament. And then because God was satisfied, fully satisfied, with that atoning sacrifice, God raised him from the dead on the third day so that we who are redeemed of the Lord could continually proclaim this good news first of all to ourselves that's the engine of the Christian life because we all still sin but then to others around us that anyone who would turn from their lawless lifestyle and that includes any of you who are here today and believe in Jesus, who would bow down to this Savior as God the Son, whom he so loved you that he sent to rescue you from your sin, that if you would do that, you would not only have your sins forgiven, but you would have, get the free gift of eternal life in Jesus' name. Well, amazingly, in spite of hearing this good news, the majority of America, I was... <laughs> I had to stop at the store for something I needed today on the way here and just seeing all of these happy, clappy Americans who have seemed to have no need for God whatsoever, no need for worshiping him. And in, in, in spite of most all of them hearing this good news of God's love in Jesus Christ, they still prefer to live life their own way without God. How about you this morning? Whose law are you living under? You're either living under the redemption that's in Christ Jesus so that you can walk in his ways by faith in this Savior, or you're still walking in lawlessness. My prayer is that's true of you, that God would grant you repentance, that you would walk in the goodness of giving him glory instead of trying to live for the glory of yourself. <clears throat> well, last week, as we finished chapter 12, we saw this dragon, this insidious monster standing on the seashore. He hates Jesus and he hates God's people and he was enacting, about to enact a strategy of how to wage war against the risen Christ who he could not get to in heaven and particularly against his saints, his people, the church on the earth. And so look with me at Revelation 13 beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. John says in describing the vision and I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads in the ancient world the, the sea represented a realm of mystery you think about it back then they had no scuba gear they had no submarines they had no idea how deep the ocean was all they knew is it was a mysterious realm of of strange creatures and it was unpredictable one day it would be calm and and enjoyable and the next day it's white and foamy and bringing possible 
deluge of, of floodwaters. But worse than that, if men went out in a ship onto the sea, oftentimes they didn't come back. And so the sea became a, a, a depiction or a figure of the abyss. It's symbolic of the abyss. In fact, that's one of my greatest grievances in the flesh is that in Revelation uh, 22, it says there will no longer be any sea. And I'm hoping that is somehow figurative for the bottomless pit because I like the ocean, but sorry to distract us. So this bottomless pit, this abyss that the that Satan evokes this uh, beast, this first beast to come out of is an incarnation of wickedness on the earth. You know, Satan is a, he incarnated as a serpent in the uh, Garden of Eden and he's incarnating here in this dragon, which is actually human form. All of these images that we see in in Revelation of these beasts come from the vision that Daniel saw in his vision of the end times. Daniel was not yet in the end times as we are, but Daniel saw visions like these beasts and or he prophesied about them. This beast has 10 horns. The horns represent power. It has seven heads representing intellect. It has a lot of craftiness. It has 10 crowns on upon the horns. In, in other words, the horns are power. And so a lot of commentators think it's political power. So he has a, a, a great deal of, uh, he's going to be a political ruler. D- does 10 horns and seven heads and crowns upon uh, them sound familiar? Well, last week we saw that that's exactly how the, the dragon, Satan, was described. This beast is an image bearer of the dragon. Allow me to pause and give you some interpretive comments here. I think it would be helpful because I know there's a lot of different ways that people interpret uh, and have in history uh, the book of Revelation. Christians who interpret the book of Re- Revelation as simply a historical timeline of future events. They see all of these prophecies as as somehow taking place in the future, conclude that the first beast John describes here will be a singular individual and that uh, a a charismatic, demonically empowered world leader who unites all political systems across the globe and installs himself as the God of the world. And the, the text certainly allows for that. That's not a totally illegitimate possibility. But I don't believe that is the the whole application that God has in mind as he gave this vision to John. And I don't think that's exactly what John thought as he recorded it. Because Paul makes it clear in the letter to 1 Thessalonians that there will be a singular individual, a man of lawlessness, Paul calls him, the Antichrist, Paul calls him. And that he will, and we're going to see that in the the coming chapters of Revelation, that there will be one incarnation of wickedness, one man of lawlessness, who empowered by demons will establish himself as a counterfeit God on the world stage, leading a large geopolitical movement of hatred towards Christ and his church. And John, who gave this revelation, was not unfamiliar with this teaching, this Concept. A lot of it comes from the book of Daniel. But I think it's interesting that the term Antichrist is not found anywhere in the book of Revelation. John, who wrote letters using that term, chooses not to use it as he describes the vision that he saw. And so John tells the churches why that is. And I believe this is a, the best application from my study of the passage that we're looking at this morning. This beast, this first beast, represents an ongoing strategy of the devil throughout the church age. Listen to how John testifies to that in 1 John 2.18. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. And so sometime prior to 96 AD, when he penned Revelation, John, who wrote Revelation, declares that it is the last hour 
Was he deceived? Did he somehow have glasses, uh, cloud uh, scales over his eyes? No, I don't think so. I think that he is using the last hour there the same way that Peter and Paul and others use the, the term last days to describe God's timeline, the period between Pentecost and Christ's return. Because when Peter begins to teach about and prepare his disciples, those he's writing the letter to, uh, for the how to wait, how to prepare for the last days, he declares that God is in no way tardy. That God's timeline is different than ours. Listen to Second Peter three eight. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Instead, Peter says, God is patient toward you and not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so I believe that John sees this beast, Satan's counterfeit incarnation of himself, as a repeated human embodiment of the devil in almost every generation. Maybe not every generation, but certainly many generations. For instance, Nero, the emperor Nero in Rome, everybody, across the board agrees that he was the the first manifestation of what John is talking about here in Revelation chapter 13. And then later, many antichrist type of political leaders come into play. We think about Hitler, who was so demonically inspired and, and also often spoke in a different tone of voice once he came into power as the Fuhrer. And so this Satan's counterfeit incarnation of himself is a repeated human embodiment of the devil in almost every generation. Look at uh, 1 John 2.22. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. If you look it up in the Greek, those articles are there. He's not talking about just the spirit of the Antichrist, although he talks about that in other verses. He, God wants us to see through our study of these visions is, is a big picture to pan out and try to grasp the ugliness of demonic activity that is behind the physical realities we're seeing playing out in our day. Not just because we might be approaching the return of Christ, which I pray that we are, but because this has been the pattern of Satan's rebellion against God and hatred for his people throughout the church age. So we want to do that so that starting in our own heart and young people, as you venture out into new uh, spheres of life, that, that's, that's so important that you understand that the, the first area of responsibility is your own heart. The first area of responsibility is not what other people think about you, but it is my heart following in the Lord and trusting in him or am I being deceived by my own emotions and the thoughts that Satan puts in my head. So God wants us to discern the difference. He paints these these horrific pictures of the battle between Satan and God so that we can learn to trust in him with all of his heart and to recognize Satan is eager to put doubts into your mind, often through his instruments, other people, that cause you to doubt the goodness of God. 1 John 4, 2 and 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. This is how we discern. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. This is in the 90s. This is 2,000 years ago. Satan depicted here as a dragon, is the spirit of the Antichrist. And throughout history, he has and will continue to summon up men to act under his demonic power as his beast. Think about that word. What's a beast? A beast is not your pet dog. A beast is an untamed, ferocious, slobbering, rabid animal that you need to be concerned about. It's not safe. He's bent on man's destruction. 
And so my exhortation in line with John's is instead of trying to match up every evil leader in every world event, whether this may be the Antichrist, be on the alert against every person, every spirit, every teaching that raises its head against the gospel. That's your job. You do that, we do that, we're in good shape. For they're all operating in the spirit of the Antichrist and the battle belongs to the Lord. And so here's our... Here's my application for us as a church. If Jesus, and he is, is our commander in chief, he simply wants us to stay in formation, walking in the footsteps of the gospel as good soldiers of Jesus Christ in this age of lawlessness. And so let's look at four ways that we can survive the mystery of lawlessness. The first is renounce counterfeit worship. Renounce counterfeit worship. Counterfeit, by definition, is an imitation of something valuable or important with the intention of deceiving or defrauding others. This perfectly describes Satan's unchanging strategy towards mankind. He aims to replace God. He aims to mimic God. He aims to deceive others and prevent them from turning to God. He uses imitation signs and wonders. You remember the the magicians in Egypt, how they did miracles with demonic power to deceive and, and act like that Pharaoh was in fact God. And so here here is a, a very helpful understanding. Because God is holy and he cannot and will not change, Satan's strategy to mimic and imitate him doesn't change either. His strategy is always the same. He's he's like a, a successful football coach, if you will. The only thing that changes on the devil's team is the players on the field. His strategy is the same in every generation. Doesn't matter how much technology a society has, how much information man has in his head, Satan is out to counterfeit God. And here in Revelation 13, we see him creating a counterfeit trinity. He's standing there on the beach, on the sand of the seashore, which some would say conveys the idea of the multitude of people on the earth, but I'm not sure. But he's standing there masquerading as God the Father. And then he begets, if you will, this first beast from the sea, from the abyss. He summons up this dragon, I mean, yeah, this, this beast that is going to image him in human form upon the earth. And he imparts to this dragon, this beast, that it's full demo, his full demonic authority, just as God has given all authority, both in heaven and earth, to Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Again, this is coming from Daniel's prophecy was like a leopard and its feet was like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. And so Satan is empowering this beast, utilizing the power of politics and media and carnal appeal to dissuade people from recognizing that their main problem is not what's going on in the world, but that they have a sin problem before God and that they need a savior. He even goes so far as to mimic Christ's resurrection. Look at verse three. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound. Mortal is something that causes death. Have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast and they worshiped the dragon for he had given his authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? Young people, again, I was writing this sermon. I didn't intend to focus on you, but I think the Lord wants me to. The the goal, the one ultimate purpose that God has created all men, all women for is worship. 
It's not success. It's not self-actualization. It is worship. And if you don't, if you refuse to worship the Lord God who created you, who formed you in your mother's womb, and if you're born again, has caused you to become a part of the new creation of God, if you refuse to worship him, you will worship Satan or one of his emissaries. You may not be aware that you're worshiping the devil, but you will and are. Notice the parallels here. The unbelieving world marvels at the counterfeit resurrection of the beast and starts following him. Nobody can figure out what this mortal wound that appears to be healed. Some would say that uh, those especially that say that the Antichrist is only Nero there in the first century, that uh, he... Uh, kind of faked suicide and hid for a while, and then he came back. So possible, I don't know. In some way, the beast mimics Christ's death and resurrection. He's an imitation savior, and he makes unlimited promises of health, wealth, and happiness to those who uh, believe in him. And he points people to the dragon who sent him. They're even crying out in false worship. You see that at the end of of verse four, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? What that is, is it's a, it's a replacement for what our hearts are designed to do. Listen to David in, in Psalm 89, six, speaking about God for who in the skies can be compared to the Lord Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? There's none like our God. But Satan is out to convince you that his counterfeit is even better. Verse 5 of Revelation 13. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. You recognize that? time stamp there, that time frame of three and a half years, 1260 days, I think it was, 42 months. It's the same one that we've seen in the last few chapters. It's the same time stamp that Daniel gave in his prophecies about the end times. And I would offer to you, in line with most of the reformers, that this time period is is a consistent figurative way of describing the church age because the devil through his agents has been profaning God and his people all through the church age. He's been saying irreverent things and cursing our king and God allowing him to rule over lost people for the entire inter-advent period, whether that be Nero or Hitler or whoever you wanna assign, any world leader on the screen today. Look at verse six, this beast opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name, his dwelling, that is those who dwell in heaven. We've told you this before, but as you study Revelation, take note that this phrase of those who dwell in heaven is referencing believers and those who dwell on the earth is always referencing unbelievers, those that are under the ruler of this world, the present darkness, Satan himself. And so God is... In, in his word here is, is referencing not your current address, but your positional authority. Either you are believing in Jesus and have died with him uh, to your sin by believing that his death was your death on the cross and you have been raised with him and are now positionally seated at the right hand of God. Either you're doing that and you are citizens of heaven or you are still operating under the throes of this present darkness and you are earth dwellers. You are all part of all who dwell upon the earth. And so the demonic domination of man's hearts is already global. That's why Satan is called the ruler of this world and and God allows the beast to so persecute the church, it says here, that just as Christ seemed defeated on the cross and the world will consider the church to be utterly extinguished. Look at verse seven. Also, it, the beast, was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. 
and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Remember, earth dwellers. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain. And so the beast desires nothing short of total dominion over the earth's population. As an imitation Christ, he simply wants to be what Jesus is, which is the head of God's people. But Christ, our head, thank the Lord, has preserved a remnant for himself, a believing remnant. And so if you're here this morning and you're believing that Jesus died your death on the cross, you're believing the gospel, the surest reason for your faith is that God decided, this is Ephesians 2 and throughout the New Testament, God decided before the foundation of the world to adopt you, to transfer you by getting you the good news of the gospel and giving you faith to believe it so that as you exercise faith in Jesus, he transfers you from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. And so the reason you have that faith, if you have faith right now in your heart, is because your name was written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. That, that brings so much security. Some of you, like me, had grew up in church and, and you've always kind of cognitively believed and then you had a time when, when, when you believed a lot and you kind of lived for Jesus and then maybe you went off to college or whatever and you, you got into sin and, and you weren't acting like a Christian at all. You never thought about God and then all of a sudden God turned on the light bulb and showed you the ickiness of where you were living in the world and, and you, be, you repented and began to follow Jesus and you were like, well, was I saved at eight? Was I saved at 19? Was I saved at 20? I don't know. Here's what I know. I believe and so my name was written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. It's recorded by God who cannot be erased. There's our security. There's our, there's our safety net. God decided to set his love upon us, not because we deserved it, not because we had done meritorious works, but because of his mercy. So we could give him all the glory and stop taking credit ourselves. That's true of you. Renounce all counterfeit worship. Renounce these idols. That's the first means of surviving the mystery of lawlessness. Second one, practice patient endurance. I don't know about you, but one besetting sin that I battle every day is impatience. I'm not proud of that, but it's true. Day by day, the Lord, through many trials, is teaching me to wait upon him and believe that his timing and his ways are better than mine. But really, that that's indicative of the whole Christian life. We're we're a people who not only gather together on Sunday morning, but walk with Jesus day by day and, and want to live for his glory. And we are waiting upon the Lord. We're waiting upon him to consummate this kingdom that he has begun in our hearts and the hearts of believers all over the world and that he will complete it in just the right time. John understood this. And it's not incidental that he opened this book of Revelation this record of his vision by identifying with all who are, guess what? Waiting upon the Lord. Look back at Revelation 1.9. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation, already happening, and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, the patient endurance that are in Jesus. Only God gives us faith to trust in him and depend on his timetable. John was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And so to be in Jesus is to trust that all of time is in his hands. I have to share with you that I'm blown away almost every Sunday I, as, as we select songs to be sung. How I, I don't plan for the lyrics to match what God is going to say through his word, but they often and almost always do all of time is in his hands remember we sang that our job is simply to submit to the leadership of his spirit and to be empowered to walk by faith in his footsteps one day at a time one day at a time 
That's why on the heels of the unsettling news of the beast being allowed to conquer the saints, the Holy Spirit led John to quote from Jeremiah's prophecy. Look at Revelation 13, 9. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. In other words, your faith in Christ cannot be conditional on what type of lifestyle you prefer. God led his own son to the cross, his own son, innocent, righteous, led him to the cross to redeem us. And he will likewise lead those who actually follow Jesus to adopt this prayer as you're charting the course of your life. Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Come what may. If you have me going into captivity for my faith, if you have me dying for my faith, not my will, but yours be done. That's walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Remember Mary, when she learned about the uncharted waters God was calling her to walk through, she said, Lord, be it done to me according to your word. I'm your servant. Here's why. Because the, the, the sum total of, of what Christians live for is the glory of God. Lord, it's not my decision about how you want to be glorified in my life. You decide it. I'm just out for that product of you being glorified, not me being happy, quote unquote. Can you commit to that even now? Especially those of you who are in the process of making decisions about your future. Lord, empower my faith to endure whatever you might allow to come until the day when I see Jesus. Third way of surviving the mystery of lawlessness is beware of religious imposters. The third component of Satan's counterfeit trinity is another beast, but this one is not from the abyss, and this is pretty significant. He's not from the sea. He's from the land. Notice how this beast seeks to impersonate the Holy Spirit. Verse 11, then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. And so this beast comes up out of the earth. Most uh, interpreters, and I agree with them, believe that this is not coming from hell. This is coming from existing human structures. In fact, most also believe that it's coming through false religion. This is going to be or is uh, across time religious leaders who use the name of God, who might even quote scripture. It's supported by the fact that beginning in chapter 16, this beast is no longer called a beast, but a false prophet. Look at how the counterfeit trinity is depicted as operating in de demonic solidarity there in verse chapter 16, verse 13. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, remember he's depicting God the Father standing on the seashore, and out of the mouth of the beast, that's the, the one that came up out of the abyss, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. They all have the same evil spirit. And so, in God, the primary role of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the true Godhead, is to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment and point people to worship Jesus. If you're seeking the Holy Spirit, that's a great thing, but the Holy Spirit wants to point you to Jesus. He wants to give you faith to trust in Jesus, to walk in Jesus' footsteps. And so the third man, member of this counterfeit Satanic Trinity mimics the Holy Spirit by instead of pointing people to Jesus, he points people to worship the first beast, the incarnation of the dragon. You see that? This human, demonically filled man that will bring glory and point people to the dragon. He's the incarnation of wickedness on 
the earth. Look at verse 11 again. This third beast, this false prophet, looks like a lamb. He has two horns like a lamb, not two horns like a cow, not two horns like a deer, not two horns like, like a moose. He has horns like a lamb, and yet he speaks like a dragon. His teaching, in other words, remember he's the false prophet, is of the dragon. He does not bring words of eternal life. He seeks to bind people to eternal death. And so beware of anyone who has the appearance of godliness and yet denies its power. What is the power of godliness? What's the power of godliness in your life? It's the cross. Jesus paid it all on the cross. That's the power of me walking with God. I know that I'm fully atoned for by Jesus Christ. And so he does this. He accomplishes this deception in sheep's clothing, even though he's a ravenous wool. And we need to avoid such dragon-empowered people like Pharaoh's musicians, as I mentioned. They do false signs and wonder. And the false prophet here, just like through some satanic power, imitates Elijah. Remember Elijah calling down fire on the prophets of Baal? Verse 13, it, this false prophet, this beast from the land, performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Note again, God is sovereign over all things. God is not hands off on all this satanic activity. He is allowing, just like he does in Romans 1, he will give men up to whatever their carnal flesh desires until they get the fill of it or until they perish forever if they refuse to believe. And so God allows him to work, work these false signs and wonders in order that earth dwellers get exactly what their flesh desires which is idolatrous union with the devil. Undeniably, our world, they, 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 this false prophet encourages them to make an idol. And that's what our hearts are, idol factories. And our world is undeniably infatuated with the idol of image. Every effort on the sun is made to create the best possible image for ourselves especially for political figures that we wish to promote and glean benefits from. We want them to be seen in the best possible light. But in decrying the folly of such idolatry, David prophesies this in, in Psalm 115.8 about idolaters. Those who make them, think about the creation of image, will become like them. So do all who trust in them. I want to ask if you could be honest this morning and just ask the Holy Spirit to examine your heart. The image of popular figures that you follow or that you aspire to, isn't that what you want to become? The profile you seek to project, whether that be through filters or just the right pose, isn't that larger than life or at least better than you feel like you are the image you wish you could actually be? That's idolatry. God calls us to renounce false worship, especially that which focuses on image. Replace that with the pursuit and cultivation of joy in God who has declared you to be in union with the only true human being that's ever lived. The most beautiful, glorified human being, Jesus Christ, is now the head of his body, the church. And we are his bride. And as we trust in him and as we find joy in him getting glory, we are being made be more beautiful every day through faith in him. Well, especially through the benefit of technology, the devil's deception through the false prophet proves to be very convincing. Verse 15, and it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. And so this false prophet inspired with demonic hatred of Satan himself launches a severe persecution 
against anyone who refuses to participate in the worship of his image of success. And increase, to increase the pressure of his coercion, he will institute or has instituted in history unprecedented commercial restrictions upon those who reject his globally accepted religion. We're seeing some of this playing out in our society right now. First of all, a global religion, a global economy, and an increasing disdain for the freedom of religion and the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 16, and it, this false prophet, causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is the name of the beast and the number of its name. And so a mark, whether it's figurative or physical, denotes spiritual allegiance. We saw that back in chapter seven, and we're gonna see it next week in chapter 14, that God sealed on their foreheads or marked his people before all of this was unveiled to us. He wanted us to know, first of all, that his chosen people were marked and sealed on the foreheads. They were marked by God. And so uh, some speculate that the beast mark, uh, you know, if comes in the days ahead, could be a barcode or a chip implant. That's possible. I don't know. I'm not God. But what is crystal clear is that followers of the beast will be clearly distinguished. Right now, or, or I shouldn't say right now, but in past generations, the, the strategy of Satan has been largely for, for uh, there not to be a whole lot of distinguishing characteristics between Christians and unbelievers. But this, this will bring about a clear distinction. Again, no middle ground. You're either on one team or the other. And so the Bible contends that the only preventative measure about if you're concerned about being marked by the beast as belonging to Satan is to ensure that you're marked by Christ. And that's our last way of surviving the mystery of lawlessness. Be marked with Christ. You remember how as before God brought the angel of destruction uh, uh, over Egypt, he commanded the Israelites to mark the outside of their doors with the blood of the lamb and he later commanded them to make formal remembrance of the Exodus as a mark on their forehead and on their hand through their, their remembrance of the Exodus. The preventive measure that God calls those who follow his son to take is to be marked by the blood of the lamb. That means that your identity is completely in the fact that you are washed in the blood, that you are under the blood, that Jesus is your head and you are part of his body. And so dis to displace intentionally, execute this in your, in your daily thinking, to displace all the apprehensions and dread as you watch the news or you think about the future, all the apprehensions and dread that stem from worrying about whether you will be able to buy and sell or whether you will even suffer martyrdom with an active fear of God and a safety and security that your name is written in his book and that you are washed in the blood of his son. The imagery of you being marked on your forehead is indicative of your thought life. That's why God sealed his servants with his Holy Spirit on their forehead. I and mean, we can talk about the feelings that we feel down in our chest cavity, but the Holy Spirit is really sealing our thought life and causing us our thoughts to be in line with scripture. And in the mark on the hands indicates the deeds that come out of our thought life. And so God wants us to declare our allegiance to him and have no fear of those who threaten to harm you for doing good. Instead, if I identi instead identify with Jesus and you will increasingly, this is the command as we seek to endure Whatever darkness comes, this mystery of lawlessness is to stand firm against all demonic threats and to take comfort that God will miraculously provide for his servants because only he is sovereign, not Satan. Last verse, 18. This calls for wisdom. And let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. 
many of you know that in the ancient world, there was something called gematria, which was a symbolic un understanding of, of calculating the number of the uh, of a b of a of to, to use the, the Hebrew consonants, and they had numbers assigned to them. And so if you add up the letters of a man's name, it would give you his number, as this verse implies. It, and this, uh, if you do that for Caesar Nero's name in Hebrew, it does total 666. But for the past 2,000 years, eager interpreters have wrote millions of pages about how, who this uh, man of lawlessness, this false prophet, this beast might be, but the wisdom and understanding called for here can be none other than the discernment that God gives his saints, enabling them to see through the delusions of the devil and stand firm against them in Jesus' name. Let's pray that God will give us grace to do that and bring him glory.